Good evening and welcome to our third panel event. So tonight's subject is, um, is restorative justice suitable after domestic violence? So Thriving Survivors are hosting this national consultation named Survivors Voices. And the purpose in the consultation is to allow survivors to share their view and their thoughts on restorative justice. So each week, every Wednesday at half past seven, we're going live on Facebook to speak to experts, survivors, organisations, just to share different views and different points of views. The consultation has no, um, no angle as to whether they want it to be, um, everyone wants it or nobody wants it. It's about getting an even um, voice across everybody, letting everybody have their say and what comes out of it is what comes out of it. So tonight's guests, we have Jane Marie, who's our survivor. We have got Alan Moore, Dr. Alan Moore from University of West of Scotland, and Dr. Marcia Scott, who's the chief executive of Scottish Women's Aid. You'll also see Victoria on the camera. So Victoria uh, keeps me right. She keeps an eye on your comments and your questions. So please interact and she will ask us any questions um, as we go through. And then we've got Jackie Forbes, who is doing illustrations to represent the conversations right the way through the uh, consultation process. So we'll start with introductions. So Jane Marie, you're here as our survivor. So can you tell us uh, a little bit about yourself, about your experience and how you came to know about Survivors Voices? Yeah. Um... I was asked to speak here by an organisation called Talk Now. Um, they're trauma counsellors, and that's how I became involved. Um, I'm a survivor of quite extensive domestic abuse, um, adverse childhood experiences, um, which were as a result of domestic violence um, all through childhood. Um, and I've experienced it all through womanhood as well. Um, I'm a criminal justice social worker. I'm also a counsellor. Um, so I would say that having um, experienced the level of violence in my formative years um, was extremely difficult for me to, to kind of handle. It was extremely difficult for me to, to understand. Um, then when I kind of progressed into womanhood and again was kind of subject to um, domestic abuse in a, a few um, relationships, um, you know, I began to just uh, search myself. That's what kind of brought me to this place of kind of searching in this kind of field. Um, but talk now, I, I've, I've arrived there um, for trauma counselling. Um, I've got complex post-traumatic stress disorder, um, which was never really diagnosed. So that's a kind of side issue that came from the domestic abuse it came from the level of domestic abuse that I was subjected to. And when I was younger, um, there was no intervention. You know, there was no intervention from social work. There was no debriefing. Um, those adverse childhood experiences were never debriefed. Um, and basically the whole process um, I've done on my own. Um, so when I was asked to speak um, on my experience this evening, um, it's both from a personal um, experience, but it's also from professional as well, working with perpetrators of domestic abuse and domestic violence. So I've got a kind of two pronged um, understanding of it as almost the survivor and um, the projects that I have um, been involved in and the projects that I've, I've had to seek to get counselling for myself, just to understand it in a, in a, in a broader sense. Um, so, as I said, I've came here because uh, I, I, I had, I've got complex post-traumatic stress disorder as a direct result of that, of that abuse. And um, so uh, it, it's, it's almost a freedom to come, you know, and to have that, that dealt with, to be able to speak about it openly um, and to just give survivors a voice. Um, I felt for many, many, many years through the system, through the criminal justice system, that my voice was completely ceased. Um, I was stigmatised, I was full of shame, I was full of guilt. That was the system that imposed that on me. Um, and so therefore as a survivor, and I think I'm a thriving survivor, 
um, because I've taken myself from one level to the next in order to, to kind of improve my understanding. Um, so I just feel as though, I, I, you know, when, when, when Pat, um, the, the manager of the organisation of Talk Now decided, she asked me and she said, would you like to have your voice heard? So I, I jumped at the chance and I said yes. Oh, that's fantastic, Jim Marie. So we really appreciate you being here and actually sharing your story. We know it can be difficult sometimes. I just want to touch on the PTSD because I've recently learned, obviously, about how PTSD is um, is quite common with any sort of um, trauma. And from me, I always just thought that it was you think about post-war or military, that's where everyone thinks of the general public or PTSD, but it's actually, there's so much more variations to it. So it's interesting you actually mentioned that because that's something that I've been learning about recently. Good. So Alan, on to you. So you're here as our restorative justice expert from the University of West of Scotland. But on top of that, you've actually written the consultation paper. So would you like to introduce yourself to so what yourself and also your role in Survivor's Voices? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm not too sure how I follow Jane Marie there. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, sure. So uh, yeah, I'm Alan. I work for the University of the West of Scotland. I have been at the university since 2007. Uh, I first became involved or interested in restorative justice almost as a happy accident, I think you could say. In 2008, I was sent a list of books potentially that I could review for one of the, the main legal journals in Scotland. And on that list happened to be a textbook on restorative justice. Now, I knew a little bit about restorative justice from my, my undergraduate um, days, but uh, I wasn't, it wasn't an area of major interest to me at that time, but upon receiving that book and, and reading this book on restorative justice, it really got me very interested in what was a sort of a quasi-legal process, I think you could call it, something that sat alongside the criminal justice system, alongside the formal legal process, but was something a little bit different that offered something different to that standard legal process. And really that's what kind of started off my interest in restorative justice back in 2008. Um, so I, I, I sort of started off as a, as, a, as a general law lecturer, but took the sideways step into uh, criminology in late 2013 as the, the PhD that I was close to finishing at that point was growing more and more socio-legal in nature. So the PhD that I was doing was sort of grounded in law, but had elements of criminology and psychology, particularly how environment can affect behavior and some different sort of aspects of psychology like that. Um, so when I took the sideways step, um, I relatively quickly took over as leading the criminal justice program at University of the West of Scotland, um, a role that I was in until only about six months ago when I took a step back, ironically to become involved in projects like this, more involved in the research um, and outreach type of activities. And alongside that, I also teach restorative justice on our Master's Applied Social Science, Applied Criminal Justice um, program at the university. Uh, and I also lead the, the victimology provision for undergraduate, which includes elements of um, gendered victimization, it includes aspects of domestic abuse, sexual victimization, other things like that. Now, through leading the, the victimology um, studies at the university, I became quite familiar with Victim Support Scotland as an organisation and decided that if I was going to be leading uh, victimology provision, that I ought to make sure that I had a bit more hands-on experience. And so I undertook all of the training that Victim Support Scotland had to offer at that point, including training in um, uh, victimisation and gender against domestic violence, uh, victimisation associate, associated with, with sexual offences and a number of other areas. So it's kind of all spilled out from there. And um, I first got involved with South Lanarkshire Council and Isabel, who of course is part of this consultation in the background. Um, when, when South Lanarkshire Council were looking at potentially developing a restorative justice strategy about three years ago, and it was really through that South Lanarkshire link that I first heard about the, the Survivors Voices consultation. So when I heard that Thriving Survivors and Ashley Scotland were looking for uh, an expert to come on board in the area of restorative justice, it just felt like the right sort of opportunity that what I'd done over the past 
13 or 14 years have sort of led up to this sort of project. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was really it. So I got on board with the project probably a couple of months ago now, it would be. And we, we've gone through the whole process, of course, of developing this consultation to go out to survivors so that they can have their say on whether or not they would become involved in restorative justice services. So I think that pretty much takes a, a little bit through where I came from to where we are now. And yeah, we're, we're obviously moving forward with the consultation. We're not looking to influence anyone's thoughts. We're really looking to try and establish what survivors' voices are, what their impressions are of restorative justice and what they would potentially like out of a new national strategy that's being developed. Thank you, Alan. That's fantastic. I know that um, I actually appreciate you being involved and how much work it's taken to actually put this consultation paper together. And it's crazy to think that we're about halfway through now. We're over halfway through since it started. And for those who don't know, the consultation paper is open until the 28th of March. So we only have 18 days left to gather the sur survivors' thoughts on it. So over to you, Marcia. So obviously you're here as our organisation um, and you're from Scottish Women's Aid. So yeah, I'd love to hear from you. Tell us about yourself and about the work that Scottish Women's Aid does. I'm usually a person rather than an organisation. So this is a different role for me, I have to say. <laughs> um, uh, uh, yep, yeah, uh, Scottish Women's Aid is Scotland's leading um, uh, survivor-led domestic abuse organization. So we, we kind of do two things. We've been around for about almost 50 years. Wow. We started in, uh, um, uh, about the same way as every important social movement has ever started in Scotland, which is around a woman's kitchen table. Um, and, you know, so, so now we're a national organization and we do lots of work um, uh, you know, around the new domestic abuse law and promoting um, uh, improvements in criminal and civil justice and a whole variety of areas. Um, but we also are the umbrella organization for 36 grassroots local organizations, each of which started out the same way, which is around somebody's table. So we try very, very hard to um, to make sure that we preserve what I geekily call a sort of data feedback loop. So we, you know, that, that the policy development work that we do and the accountability, you know, the work that we try to do to help um, our partners in, in the police and in the prosecution service and in health and in education to improve their responses to children and women living with domestic abuse. Um, uh, and, and we're constantly feeding out what we're hearing from the coal face and from what the, the workers in women's aid and the children and women who we support um, uh, tell us they, they, they're they experiencing and feed that back in and then feed what we are hearing and doing back into them. Doesn't always work perfectly. It's a complex process. COVID has, as you might imagine, complicated all of our lives around all of this. But um, in general, I think it's, uh, you know, we, we, we remain, probably our unique thing is that, is that our intelligence and our evidence is so linked to the real experiences of children and women. Thank you, Marcia. That's fantastic. And it fits in so well that obviously this consultation is survivors' voices. It's all about the survivors. So um, it's very apt that you are here. And 36 organisations to Umbrella is quite the task. <laughs> oh, you bet. And they ain't easy, some of them, let me tell you. But if everywhere from Shetland down to, to um, Danoon and over to Jedburgh, it's, um, it's a very diverse network. And which is good because we have a a lot of diverse women in Scotland, you know, and survivors, as as many of us will experience all the time, are not a heterogeneous group. They're very diverse, you know. They have age and disability and race and all kinds of experiences, and they deserve that we re reflect the complexity of their lives. Yeah. Very true. It's very true. 
So we're going to go on to discuss obviously restorative justice. That is the purpose of why we're here. And I'm just going to go around the table and ask you, obviously, what's your view on restorative justice after domestic violence and your reasons behind it? What's brought you to that? Um, how you think about it? So, Jane Marie, over to you first. Um... I feel that um, given my experience um, and a survi being a survivor, um, there have been kind of two things that have happened. Um, I've had to go through the court process, first of all. And secondly, I've had to um, have that experience where um, perhaps I brought charges and then later on decided to drop those charges. Um, so I would feel, given my experience, that um, every behaviour for me, um, there's a reason for it. Um, and so I would like to find out that reason. And I know that, um, you know, through the court process, and if that kind of ends up in some form of custody, I'm aware that there are there are programs running um, within the prison system that do address behaviours. Um, not very well, I may add, not very well. Um, but my thinking is that I'm very much a kind of like, uh, let's not deal with the punitive side only, but let's deal with the therapeutic side too. And so the therapeutic side for me would involve restorative justice after domestic abuse, um, I realised the complexities because I've been there, you know, I've been in that place where I've been homeless, I've been afraid, I've needed protection, and I've been frightened to go through the court system because I found it really daunting. And I think, um, you know, research for me as well, reading different reports and things like that, um, on how perpetrators are actually dealt with within the court system, maybe by monetary fines or, you know, in, in, in certain cases, there are custodial sentences. I know that everybody's diverse. Marsha kindly po pointed that out. Every person's um, experience and needs are diverse. But again, you know, when I was asked this question, does restorative justice work after domestic abuse? I just thought to myself, it does, it does. Um, it's a, for me, it's a chance um, to kind of understand the kind of the, 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 the psychology. Um, and then if we understand that psychology and the reasoning behind that, you know, I'm, I'm, minimi I'm, I'm not minimizing it, I'm generalizing it, forgive me for saying that, but why a man feels that he has the power to meet or physically abuse or sexually abused, emotionally abused a woman, I think it's, for me, I, I would need to try and kind of understand that. Initially, when that happened to me, you know, over the, the different periods of my life, the, the first reaction from me was a very punitive reaction, you know, jail them, don't let them back out again, and punish them. As I developed, uh, you know, as, as I kind of matured in age-wise, and also in my, my kind of education, I understood that that punitive um, approach really doesn't, for me, my own personal opinion, it doesn't solve the problem. Um, so restorative justice, if managed properly, you know, I was involved in a, a restorative justice project within SACRO for a while. And I found that the, the way that that was managed, the way that that was, um, you know, that Sometimes it was extremely difficult. Sometimes it wasn't a goer. You know, I'm not saying it's for everybody, but I, I would say that within that project, I witnessed um, healing in some way, you know. Um, and I know it's a long process. I've been through that long process myself. Um, it's a very difficult, it's a very complex process. But I think for me, you know, having that level of violence, that level of violation against myself perpetrated against me, for me personally, I, I looked for some sort of kind of closure and some sort of healing in that process. Um, and restorative justice over the years has, has definitely kind of, it's been a preferred method for me. Um, I think it's, it's, if we just, well, if, if, Speaking for myself personally, you know, 
again, I mentioned at the very beginning when, when all of these things were happening and against me, which I didn't ask for, the, the initial thought was punish, 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 punish. But as times went on, I think that punishment only serves just a small, you know, it only serves, serves a small purpose. I understand the, the need for it. It's a deterrent. It can be in some cases. But I think overall, I would say that education, understanding that women who have been through that process and offering survivors what they need, but also focusing on the perpetrators as well, in order that, that's, that that crime and that cycle is not continually perpetuated and that we can come in at some point to try and just, you know, bring different strategies in to understand that. And as Alan was saying, you know, the kind of socio-economic um, kind of situations that people are, are certainly the, the perpetrators for me, um, it, it was within the family home. Um, and so I, I, would, I would certainly say that that's a difficult position to be in. Um, it's a difficult position to be sitting homeless with your child and, and waiting to see where you're going to go next. Um, certainly at that point, if you'd have asked me about restorative justice, I'd have said, no, I think we'll just we'll, we'll, we'll look for incarceration and we'll lock, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll lock the doors and the keys. But as I said, with things and knowledge, um, I, I certainly feel that restorative justice is, is more beneficial and more therapeutic. Thanks, Jane Marie. So it's funny, actually, every panel we've done, it's come up every time about the timing and the timing being right as well. And like you said, you've had moments where it wouldn't have been an option at all, whereas now it's something that you would consider. So do you agree with that, that it's very much down to the individual and the timing as well for those who would consider it? Well, it's taken me a period of, it's probably been bottled up for a long time, you know, through childhood, with the adverse childhood experiences, all of that abuse that was going on there, you know, the mindsets that were changed in, 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 in me. And so it's taken, I would say, um, the, the vast majority of, well, 12 years for me to go through that process. So it is a timing issue, you know, and I, and I think people who are delivering restorative justice I've seen it delivered very well in the past and I've seen it delivered not so well in the past. But I think those who are delivering restorative justice to a very sensitive and complex issue as domestic abuse have to understand that it's very much a time and issue and have to be able then to work through that with both the survivor and with the perpetrator. So timing, I would say, is essential. Um, I just wish it hadn't taken me 12 years to come at this point. <laughs> but timing is essential, I would say. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Jane Marie. So, Alan, what's your question of sort of justice and your, your reasons behind it? Oh, where do I start? Um, OK, well, I mean, there's a few things that have been said already that I think do resonate very much. Um, first of all, the individuality that's been talked about. That's, of course, very important. But the reality is that uh, the criminal justice system, the formal criminal justice system, isn't set up particularly well to deal with individual circumstances. There's a, a bit of deviation there can be between sentencing and, and some other bits and pieces, but the, the, the majority of the time is effectively a one-fits-all approach that is taken in the formal justice system. And that really doesn't recognise the reality that there's very different circumstances uh, between different survivors and the circumstances that they were in at the time that they were suffering abuse and the circumstances that they may be in at the point that they decide that they want to engage with something like restorative justice. But likewise, there's also the issue that there's sometimes a bit of a misconception that restorative justice is just one type of process. But in actual fact, again, that's not the, the case at all. There's a variety of different restorative justice processes that can be utilised depending on the circumstances. So, for example, there is evidence in some studies that goes to show that if, let's say, coercive control is a concern, if re-traumatisation in a one-for-one -one meeting between the person that's been harmed, the survivor, and the person that caused harm, the perpetrator, if there's likely to be some element of that, 
There have been studies in the past that have shown that if there's a wider family group involved in some type of restorative justice process, that in many cases, the, the person that caused the harm, the perpetrator, may be less likely to try and exhibit those other signs of coercive control in the restorative justice process itself. So there are different ways that the restorative justice process can be amended to suit the circumstance of the individual, of the survivor, and the circumstances related to that survivor. Also, I think it's really important to remember that there's never going to be, or at least I don't think there's ever going to be a circumstance where a survivor is forced to take part in restorative justice. It's always going to be an option as opposed to something that is mandated to a survivor. So to me, by saying automatically that restorative justice isn't suitable, all that's really doing is taking away choice for someone such as Jean Marie, who is saying that although she may not have been in a position you know, 12 years ago to have wanted to take part in this sort of process, at some point in the future, when a survivor does want to engage with the process, all it's really doing is taking away the choice that that survivor might have. Um, you know, again, there's an awful lot of research, particularly from the feminist literature, that does talk about the fact that a lot of the issues behind domestic uh, violence, domestic abuse, do result in taking agency away from women in particular. They, they take away that, that choice that women have in a lot of areas. And there's the possibility that by removing choice yet again, that that could actually cause further damage to survivors um, than what any involvement in the process might cause. Um, so, I mean, there, there's a few reasons then, I think, that's some of them. There's also further reasons as well in that the formal justice system, again, isn't necessarily particularly good when it comes to certain segments of society, whether it's segments of ethnic minority groups, different religious circumstances, whereby people may not be willing to report issues to the formal justice system. The restorative justice may, depending on the stage it can be offered at, provide an alternative that doesn't necessitate potentially having to report something to the formal justice um, process, the formal criminal justice system. That would depend on the nature of the criminal justice process that's followed, though. So, you know, for example, in England and Wales, there's three stages that restorative justice can be used. One where it can be used by the police themselves, where no formal justice process is taken forward. One where it can be used, which is a stage two or a level two, where it can be used either as a diversion from prosecution or in addition to a prosecution, or level three when it's usually used post-sentence. So depending on what type or what stage of the criminal justice process restorative justice may be used, it may be able to address some of those sorts of um, issues. Likewise, particularly if level one, now we need to be careful with level one because level one um, of restorative justice, if that's used by the police, does tend to be used when it's, when it's what you would say a minor offence or an offence that they're unlikely to be able to take forward for prosecution, um, whereby they would ordinarily note it as not being taken forward. Now, we do need to be careful because on one hand, of course, we do not want in any way to minimise the significance or seriousness of domestic abuse as an offence. But likewise, what they do have in some jurisdictions is the discretion when uh, a circumstance which isn't particularly uncommon with domestic abuse, whereby you have often the male perpetrator that is in actual fact someone who reports the female victim for something and paints themselves out to be the victim. So in some circumstances, the police, if they were to turn up, let's say, at an address, and even if they know in reality what's going on behind the scenes here, and they know that, let's say, the man in question is the perpetrator and not the victim, uh, if we were to follow the ordinary rules of, of evidence that have to be followed in order to take a justice process forwards, that might result in no intervention, nothing being possible to be done for the real victim in that circumstance. Whereas it may be possible under some processes, and this does exist again in some jurisdictions, whereby the officer in that circumstance may have the ability to actually try and investigate a little bit further what's going on by actually doing something that involves a restorative justice type process to try and get to the bottom of the root issues. Now those root issues are important as well because again the reality is that the formal justice system isn't particularly good at actually addressing the root cause issues of harm. It really isn't. 
Um, what it does best is really punish. There are other elements to it, as Jane Marie has said very much, but what it does best is punish and not really necessarily address those root cause issues or force um, perpetrators, people that have caused harm, to face the realities of what their offending has actually caused. Finally, what I would say, I guess, because there's so much I could talk about, but finally what I would say here is that one thing that's often missed out of the conversation about restorative justice is that it has a, what you would call rehumanizing or humanizing effect, whereby it's very easy, um, particularly when you've got somebody that's suffered harm being separated from someone that's caused harm, to in, in, the, in that person's mind to develop this picture that they're a monster, they're not a human. And likewise, it's very easy for the perpetrator to take themselves out of the situation and not realize the human suffering that their actions have in reality caused, the actual impact of that uh, victimization that they have actually caused to someone else. And quite often through the restorative justice process, there's evidence that has that's been shown in some studies that have shown that that humanization process has actually taken place through even in some cases, quite short meetings, you know, 20 or 30 minute meetings can result in a bit of rehumanization between the person that suffered harm, the victim, the survivor, and the, the, the perpetrator, the person that caused the the harm, and in many cases, that rejuvenization can actually be part of a, a healing process for victims. Now, it's important to say that this is not a perfect solution, restorative justice. There is still, you know, we can't get around the fact there is still the potential for um, re-traumatization or further traumatization to happen. There's no getting around that. It is a possibility. What we have to rely upon, as Jane Marie, I think it was mentioned, is that Nobody would be getting flung into this process without there being um, risk assessments and suitability assessments carried out to ensure that, that whatever the case in question is would be a suitable one, an appropriate one for some sort of restorative justice process to take place. That there would be, there would have to be fully trained uh, and qualified practitioners involved here, background work done related to every case and ensuring that those cases that are taken forward for restorative justice are ones whereby it truly is the most appropriate. Now that's never going to remove all risk, it's not going to. But then in the formal justice system, can we not say that there's also the potential for trauma? Uh, I mean, there are examples even in recent years of victims of either domestic or sexual abuse, horrible as it is to say, but committing suicide after having to um, give testimony in court because of the manner, the adversarial manner that has been handled. And restorative justice processes would never be adversarial in nature in the same way that you would find in a criminal, a formal criminal justice courtroom. So trying to involve a, a process that is not adversarial, but is still facing up to the, the root issues and individually tailoring that towards the circumstance um, of that individual survivor. Those, I think, are the potential real benefits of restorative justice. But again, I'm not wanting to sit and say it's perfect, it's not perfect, there are downsides to it. No doubt some of those could be highlighted by either Jane Marie or Marsha here as well. Um, but from my side, that's potentially some of the benefits and some of the things that restorative justice could do, maybe a little bit differently to what is happening in the formal justice system. That's fantastic, Alan. It, there are so many things to think about, isn't there? there are so many angles, pros and cons. Um, it was interesting that you mentioned some of the perhaps myths and misconceptions. And it might be worth me to know if anyone's watching that on Thriving Survivors, Survivors Voices YouTube, we did link up with Alva Griffith, who's been through restorative justice in Ireland. And she gives a list of 10 of the things that are most most asked or not not understood. Um, so we have 10 of them with her giving, you know, a clearer picture or answer. Um, so it's worth checking them out, even if you, particularly if you're looking to fill in the consultation, it's worth getting the information about it in advance as well. So thanks for that, Alan. That was uh, very thorough and there's a lot of stuff to think about in there. So Marsha, obviously, <laughs> You're representing 36 organisations, and I can't imagine you can give an answer for all of them. So you as a person, um, yourself, what's your view on the start of justice? Well, I think um, I can, I do represent our network, and um, um, all the time. 
Uh, and I have to say, and there's an echo in this room here somewhere, so I don't know if somebody needs to mute, but um, the uh, but as an organization, we don't have a um, position on the suitability of restorative justice for domestic abuse cases yet. Um, I, and I would be lying if I didn't say we were deeply, deeply wary um, of, uh, of, of its use, and I'll outline why. But we also really, really want to hear from the women and children in our system. So we've actually been helping with the design of the, of the questionnaire um, and, uh, and we'll be very happy to, to uh, assist with the analysis of the data as a result. Because I think that often we all assume that we know what women and children think um, uh, and, and we fail to ask them. Um, I think uh, from our perspective, there's, there's, a, there's, some, there's a few pros and there's a few cons. Um, uh, one of the biggest reasons why we, we want to hear what women and children think is that we think that the criminal justice system offers very limited opportunities for justice for women and children living with domestic abuse. And I think that this question of what is justice is deeply interesting for us. Uh, um, there was a study done, I think the University of Bristol a few years ago, um, and I think the title of the report is called Procedural Injustice. And it spent, there was a lot of qualitative research with victims of um, uh, domestic and sexual assault uh, and, and asking them what they thought justice was. And it was very far from what um, uh, is often portrayed as justice. It had almost nothing to do with the outcome of their cases in the criminal justice system which were almost always unjust in some version or another. Um, uh, and a whole lot more to do with how they were treated. Um, the, the whole question, absolutely, Jane Marie, of stigma um, and coercion. And also um, something that survivors that we, that we worked with uh, in the um, run up to the passage of the new domestic abuse bill said time and time again, that justice, they were never going to get justice in their own personal cases. You know, the system was never going to hold their, their perpetrators accountable, you know. So justice couldn't be defined for them that way. Um, and justice was defined for them by seeing that the system heard what they said and responded in some way so that some future woman would not have to experience or some future child would not have to live with the world that they lived with and and i i can live with that i can live with that definition of justice um but i also think that that means that we need to think about what the why is the system as it exists so unjust for women and children and part of the reason is there is so little real understanding of the dynamics of domestic abuse in every element of our civil and criminal ju justice response. So um, the, the difficulty then is that the evidence that's gathered about cases, the, the um, process that happens in both defense and prosecution um, and the, 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 the opinions of judges are all colored by um, uh, everybody's personal under personal conviction that they understand domestic abuse and they don't need anybody to explain it to them. And that, that, that means that what women have told us their experiences in court have really looked like have been things like if they went in and told their story and they were, they, they were using every coping mechanism that they had and, and skill that they had, and they were telling their story straightforwardly and weren't demonstrating huge amounts of um, um, uh, emotion in it, then clearly they were lying. And if they were very emotional um, and did, did share the emotional impact of their experience, they were hysterical and not reliable witnesses. So it's a, it, it was a, it's a, you know, a catch 22. So, so this, this means for me that I really wanna know what women want 
I absolutely um, uh, think that we don't have sufficient tools for delivering justice at the moment. So I'm looking for solutions to that or multiple avenues, I suppose. My deep, deep cynicism about the criminal justice system, however, colors my concerns about any system that can, that's going to deliver any restorative justice process. Because my, my understanding is that the system really is not confident around women's experiences of domestic abuse. It doesn't understand how being poorer, how being homeless, how being not around the tables of power, and how being held responsible for everything that happens in a family to your children um, constrains a women's agency and, and space for action. And so she gets blamed over and over and over again for actions that are not hers. And I don't trust our system as it is currently configured with the best intentions in the world not to blame her again and not to put her at risk. I'm not sure that we can do this in a way that actually provides safety. And, and I, I, my, but I want, I want to believe that we can and, and that it will only ever happen in cases where women really consent. But the difficulty at the moment, so we have all kinds of cases in our caseload of women who have been um, told that it wasn't mandatory to go to mediation, but the indication, so, but they might be told by their lawyer, we're not going to mention the domestic abuse in this custody and visitation case because you'll be seen as a non-compliant partner in the, in the legal case. So let's just not talk about the domestic abuse. And then when it looks like the court is going to give this uh, um, abusive father uh, custody or visitation or overnights or whatever the question is, and she says, wait, wait, I have to tell you about the abuse that was going on here and why this man is a danger to this child. Then the court says, oh, well, you're lying because you have told us before. Yeah. Is a catch 22 over and over and over again for women and, and for children. And so in order for restorative justice to work, we need to have a faith in the system's understanding of children's lives and women's lives and of how the their lives color their experience of domestic abuse. And I'm not sure I can be persuaded that that can be provided, but I want to be. So yes, and I think the added reason for us to be considering this is that, you know, it's, it's clear that race and disability have, a, you know, a multiplier effect on the insensitivity of our systems and that, that black women um, disabled women, you know, women who are experiencing some kind of um, discrimination in the system are going to get even less justice than others. And, and maybe, maybe this is something that we can think about um, as, uh, as an, an ameliorator, uh, amelioration for them because the existing set of tools is not appropriate. I don't know if I actually think that but I do know that we need to have open minds about what some of the, the options might be um, for those women. I think that's pretty much us. I, and I would say that anybody who's planning to roll out, however, I just want to say one, anybody who's planning to roll out restorative justice in the context of domestic abuse before this consultation is complete, really needs to go back and look at what, are, are they gonna make money out of it? Are they setting up a whole new, you know, professional qualification that they're going to get paid to train people on. I want to know why that is, because until we hear from women living with domestic abuse and children living with domestic abuse, then then nobody should be planning to roll this out. That's so true. That's so true. I completely agree. Marcia, I've got a question for you, and this is something that came up after the last panel event, and it kind of ties into what Jane Marie and Alan has been said as well. So I'm actually quite curious on everyone's thoughts on this one because when it was put to me I didn't know the answer and I'm definitely not a professional in this field I'm just here hosting it so I'm really curious um what your thoughts are so obviously restorative justice the one of the reasons is to give another 
option and the power to obviously the victim to um, to lead this process under whatever the guidelines would be. But somebody said to me, well, you're giving them the choice, that's great, but what if they choose they want to do this, but they're not ready, and then they then see that they're told no, and they see that as another rejection. So where something's put in place to give them the power, it's then taken away because they're not ready. So what's your thoughts around that? Because, yeah, yeah. that for me, that gives completely the two sides. And I, I didn't know the answer. And I was like, Phew, no idea. But by that point, our discussion was over. So I'm really curious tonight to hear people's view on that. I think this is, it's what, what's the problem we're trying to solve here? I mean, if the problem we're trying to solve here is to offer more justice in a system that is unjust, then, then the decisions need to be in the power of the people who are experiencing the injustice. And if the reason, if the problem we're trying to solve is crowded courts um, and uh, a lack of uh, effective um, perpetrator programs in domestic abuse, um, both of which are true and problems, um, then, then clearly women's voices and agency are, isn't going to probably be the first principle of the operation of the, of the programs. So my, I guess my feeling is that um, if you can't offer it in a way that offers women more agency and more control, then you shouldn't offer it at all. Okay, thank you. Jean Marie, as a survivor, what's your thoughts on that? Obviously, you've um, expressed that it's something you'd be interested in, but how would you feel if you were then told, no, you're not ready? You're on mute, you're on mute. I, I would totally um, kind of agree with what Marsh is saying in that respect. Um, a system that has been, um, in my experience, I, I've experienced um, more punishment and re-traumatisation from the system than I did from the actual events. And so um, I think when I, you know, when I spoke earlier and I said that if restorative justice is being offered, um, then it's, a, it's an extremely sensitive and a very delicate procedure and process. And I wouldn't put any trust in the system whatsoever. It's barbaric, um, it's, it, it reinforces shame, um, it's inhumane, it's degrading, um, it doesn't seek any sort of um, restoration, in, in, in my opinion. Um, in fact, as I said, I was deeply re-traumatised by the system or the systematic approach. So I think if personally I was told that I wasn't ready, I would need to be kind of questioning, well, where's that coming from? Um, again, going back to Marsha's point, I have got absolutely no faith in the criminal justice system. Um, I've got no, no faith in those who are on the front line who deal with women who are coming in abused, traumatised, violated. There are skill sets urgently required on that kind of front line um, in order for them to deal with, with women and children who are presenting. I just don't, I, I didn't see it in the 10, 12 years that I was, I was dragged through the system. So again, it would need to be somebody who was um, really quite kind of informed um, on, a, on a criminal level and also on a therapeutic level. So if I was told, I mean, for the 12 years I had to gauge on my own because of the lack of experienced voices coming in and telling me that this is what I needed. Um, so I had to gauge each stage on my own um, to, to decide whether, first of all, I was able to do it. And secondly, which avenues I would need to take in order for that to be done. Um, so rejection, you know, I, I, I don't think I could possibly face any more rejection if I was told no, that that wasn't suitable for me. Um, but broadly for women who are, are coming in to, um, to that process, I would, I would really kind of advocate that it, 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 would, it, it, would, it would have to be very, 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 very well thought out. Um, it would have to be um, extremely, um, you know, the, the people who are delivering that, who are telling people that they're not ready for... Um, for, for, for the next stage and the next set of, of whatever they have to go through. 
they really would have to be extremely well informed um, and extremely um, sensitive, compassionate, understanding and um, experienced practitioners along the line, um, you know, so that people don't come to that point. I mean, somebody who's like myself, who's has been violated, who's that these things have happened, and then I'm coming into a system, and again, there's another big um, cell door being closed on me, and I'm told, I'm sorry, you can't enter that. Um, potentially, for for other people going through this this system, it could be extremely damaging. Um, so again, I think it would need to be really kind of well thought out. Um, in order to be delivered. Thank you. Thanks, Marie. So I think we've got a question from the public. So Victoria, do you want to read that out for us? Is there any benefits for perpetrators going through restorative justice? Alan, do you want to go with that one? Yes, and I'm off mute, thankfully. Um, yeah, absolutely, there is. Now, I think that what's really important is that any restorative justice strategy that's going to go forward in Scotland is going to be going forwards on the basis that it's the, the victim that's at the heart, the survivor that's at the heart of the process. So that's what's of paramount importance. But there are countless studies that have also shown that there are benefits to, or potentially benefits to perpetrators or offenders as well. Um, there is a, a limited amount of evidence, but there is evidence from England and Wales that does show a reduction in uh, reoffending, for example. And I think actually going back to that point that I made earlier on about the, the humanisation, and actually in some circumstances, not through the adversarial formal justice system when someone is sitting across the courtroom from, from someone, but it's totally different. Again, going back to my PhD days of um, environment and behaviour, but it's totally different if you're actually sitting much closer to a person in a room, having more of a, an actual conversation with that person that's not being guided by lawyers, um, to be quite blunt. That there's more of a, a discussion there and there's more of a real and authentic discussion that's happening there. And that in many cases, when you do have an environment that is more, I hesitate to use the word controlled because that's maybe the, well, not the best term to use, but it's more carefully constructed, an environment that's more carefully constructed, that's facilitating um, that conversation in a genuine way, whereby the, the, the offender, the perpetrator, the person that caused harm, is genuinely able to see the impact, the real impact uh, that, that their actions have had on somebody else's lives. Now, again, is every offender going to you know, see the light and change because of that? No, absolutely not. They're not. But a, a proportion of them, once they've actually seen the effects that they have, may well desist from any further offending. So there are absolutely benefits that can be had there. Um, there's also the opportunity for, uh, as part of the process, whereby the offender themselves may be the one that wants to propose what they can actually do to try and make good whatever harm they've caused. Now, that may not necessarily be something that's accepted by uh, the survivor, let's say, but the opportunity for them to genuinely Unlike, again, in the formal justice system, whereby it's a judge that's sitting deciding on sentencing and punishment, for the, the individual offender themselves to be the one to actually make a decision on, well, this is what I could offer, this is what I can try and do to show that I genuinely have a level of remorse. And in many cases, that that's something that can be cathartic for the, um, for the offender themselves. But I would like to also go back, if it's okay, Heather, and just add something to the question that you'd asked before as well. Um, because I think there's two things that are important on the previous question that you'd asked about the system, whereby if somebody's being told, well, actually, you're not ready. I think there's two things that are really important here. The first thing is that whatever, whatever restorative justice service is eventually implemented in 2023, when it's supposed to be rolled out by the Scottish Government, whatever the service is that's rolled out, um, it shouldn't be a question of one try and then shut off. That should not be the case at all. It should be for uh, victimisation such as that's uh, suffered by, 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 by survivors of domestic abuse or sexual abuse. It should be recognising that actually the time it's appropriate for someone to take part will be very different from survivor to survivor. And therefore, there may well be the case 
that somebody isn't ready after, let's say, six months or a year or two years. But the system should be designed from the start in such a way whereby it then allows, it's open, it's open, first of all, with the survivor to say there is always the possibility that this won't, that you won't be ready for this just now, but that that will not close off or preclude you from then coming back and um, potentially through a re-evaluation, being able to engage with it in another year or another six months, however long that interval may be. But importantly as well, the other, the second important part is that whatever the restorative justice service that comes in is, it also shouldn't be an isolated service. It should be a service that is fundamentally linked with other agencies, including criminal justice, social work, including counselling. So that if there is an evaluation and someone's told they're not ready, it's not a question of so bye bye out the door. It's a question of you're not ready, but here's what we can offer that we think might be able to assist you with being ready at some point in the future. Now, again, there's no crystal ball that can tell you exactly when that's going to be. But in, uh, to me, that's the two important issues. First of all, the service is not an isolated service. It's engaging with other services that will help survivors. And secondly, again, that it's not a one chance and bust situation, that there would be multiple opportunities offered to a survivor um, to ensure that at the point they are ready to engage, if they choose to engage, then the option is there. So I guess the design, the design is everything. And that's why the voices of survivors at this stage are everything. Yeah. Marsha, do you want to come in? Yeah, a couple things. Um, I guess one thing, I, uh, and I, just, I just revisited the action plan on restorative justice today because I was doing my homework for this show. Um, <laughs> and uh, domestic abuse is not mentioned in that plan one place. I think we need to make sure that we're really clear here that the assumption is not that it's going to go forward. That, and this is a really important investigation about whether it should go forward. The second thing though, is that an awful lot of what you described, Alan, I think, um, is some of the good work that happens in our Caledonian per, um, perpetrator programs. And, um, and, and unfortunately, women often hear that their perpetrator is not appropriate because he shows no remorse um, for a perpetrator program, in which case it's probably not appropriate for restorative justice intervention either. But, you know, that is, a, that is a hugely tested, accredited, invested in program. So if we're looking at something that's an alternative to the punitive adversarial model and that um, is linked with evaluation around um, reducing recidivism, that's where we should be looking. Um, I don't think we can put, I think that's a really heavy burden to try and ask restorative justice. I mean, you know, a Caledonian program is, is a long, you know, intense program. And even they don't get, you know, don't have, always have high levels of, of effectiveness in terms of reducing recidivism. So I'm, I really don't think we can expect that restorative justice would deliver what Caledonia can. Thank you, thank you. Um, so we've got other uh, questions from the public. So if there's anything else you guys want to ask each other, You've all been absolutely amazing. And every time I do these, I come away with so many more questions and so, so much more confused with um, what, what, what the answers should be. And I suppose that's exactly why this consultation is happening because those who have experienced um, either sexual abuse or domestic violence, domestic abuse, they are the ones that have to answer it because they're the ones that have the answer to what works for them. So thank you so much, Jane Marie, um, Alan, Marsha. It's been amazing listening to you. And for everyone else listening, a um, couple of things just remind you that the Misconceptions and Myths videos are on our YouTube channel. We'll be here again next week at 7.30. Um, we have information sessions three times a week, and that just gives you, anyone can book onto that, be it an organisation, an individual, a company, anyone that wants to learn about restorative justice, what it is, what the myths are, and what the consultation is, and how it came about, they're bookable on our website or on social media. Um, and also the consultation is live. It's on our social media. We'll put it in the comments as well, the link straight to it. There's a lot of information on there um, before you even get to the questions. 
and also on the post for this live, there's also Isabel's email. Now we appreciate that this may bring up questions or feelings that you need to discuss with somebody. We are here to do that. Isabel is here. Drop her an email. She will phone you and chat to you. Um, Marcia, have you got something else? Yeah. And I always forget to say something. So thank you very much for giving me a chance. I just want to point to people, point people to if you're experiencing domestic abuse or someone you love is, or someone you're you're a, you know a professional in a professional role with, and you want some some help or some answers, our 24-7 helpline is always available for all of those things for anybody in Scotland. Um, and the number on that is 0800 027 1234. And there's a web chat function if you're in an existing abusive situation and you can't um, uh, you can't be over in, the, in lockdown, this is a big problem, and you can't be overheard calling for support. Um, so you can just type in your questions or you can send us an email. And most importantly, you know, 36 local services, wherever you live in Scotland, there's a local women's aid, works with women and children just like you. Um, uh, and, um, and please take advantage of, of that service because they're there for you. That's fantastic. Thank you, Marcia. We'll put those details into the post as well so people have them. Um, and thank you so much, everybody. We will see you next week. Alan, Jane Marie and Marcia, there's an awful lot of comments and conversation going on um, just now on the Facebook page. If you've got a few minutes afterwards to nip on, go on and read it, maybe answer any questions and yeah, just see what people are saying. And thank you so much. Um, and thank you to everybody watching.